understood. Are some things in the Bible hard to be understood? Yeah. But can they still be understood? Yes. They may be hard to be understood. You might know, not know exactly where the piece of puzzle goes, but sooner or later it will have a, a place where it fits. And the point is it should be understood. those new ones on Wednesday night yeah. uh, that one's a bit high we need to bring that one down yeah, a little bit yeah awesome. for sure yeah. all right well it's time for our jam club so all the young people uh, can be dismissed at this time well I just turned the heat down so <laughs> it went up to 72 so we took it down again hey man good to have a good group uh, here tonight with the young people. Okay, go ahead and keep the light on, Brother uh, Joseph, if you don't mind. Uh, all the slides you should be able to see from <clears throat> uh, uh, tonight, no problem. And we will be getting to some slides a little later on, but we're going to start uh, in Second uh, Peter chapter 1, please, if you'd like to turn there. In fact, I'm going to take my jacket off, I think. <clears throat> Uh, First Peter, sorry, Second Peter, chapter one, and so we're moving on in our study on prophecy. We're looking at the essentials, and the reason why this is so important is because I believe that many people today have no idea why they believe what they believe about prophecy, and usually it always starts with the argument about the about the, the rapture. Well, the, the name, the word rapture is not in the Bible, and things like that. Well. Um, it, it's, it's much deeper than that, much broader than that. And so we're starting with the essential things. And we've tried over the last couple of weeks to uh, give forth the argument that the, the church is not Israel. And in order for you to make the church Israel, you have to take the promises that were given to national Israel, not only the people, but also Jerusalem and the promised land and all of that and try to apply that to the church and you can't do it if you take the scriptures literally you just can't do that and so the first essential and the second essential really go together and what we're looking at tonight we'll probably not finish it tonight um, the prophetic scriptures must be interpreted literally now of course we have no problem inter interpreting the rest of the bible literally when it comes to teachings about salvation then obviously uh, we have no problem taking that literally. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's pretty clear. Um, and God makes it clear so that we can understand it and therefore believe it. Well, in Second Peter chapter 1, we're going to read from verse 16 to verse 21 tonight as we begin our study. And this is the testimony of the apostle Peter concerning the scriptures and really in comparison with his own experience. So in verse 16... It says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto light, a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And our Father in heaven, and Lord, who is with us tonight, for where you've, you've promised where two or three are gathered in your name, that you're there in the midst of them. And Lord, we love you and we thank you and we invite you, Lord, into this meeting and to our study tonight. Lord, we want to read and teach your word this evening. And uh, we want you and we need you, Lord, to be our helper to understand the scriptures and to understand these things that are so important. And Lord, thank you that you are here with us Thank you that you love us. Thank you that we are uh, the apple of your eye, that we are um, uh, loved by you. And Lord, that we uh, hold your attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and Lord, meeting the needs that we have in each one of our lives. But Lord, teach us the things that are eternal and help us, Lord, to be brought into the knowledge of 
uh, of prophetic things that you've told us that the Holy Spirit has given us to teach us of things to come. And Lord, may you be our teacher tonight. And so, Lord, we, we long for you and we look for you. And we, we cry, Lord, even tonight, even so, come, Lord Jesus. But Lord, help us to know why we should be looking and give us help and understanding as we look into the scriptures tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you look at your notes here, we're just going to go through uh, the notes. Um, we could take this, you know, a long, we could take a long time going through this. I, I try not to do that. And so we'll try to get through it as quickly as we can, but as meaningfully as we can. First of all, Scripture is given to be understood. You know, why would, why would God go to all the trouble of writing the Bible and then for somehow to, to write it in such a way where a, a normal person um, who can read uh, couldn't possibly understand it. People have a, a lot of problems with the book of the Revelation. The name Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is written to reveal God. And the Bible is given to us that we might understand it. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? And so God has written the Bible uh, in a way that it is understandable. And uh, this is also true not only of, of all the scriptures, but, uh, but also of the prophetic scriptures as well. And a lot of times uh, theologians say, well, uh, everything other than prophetic uh, is literally, but when you get to the prophetic scriptures and Israel and the church and all of that, then you've got to do something different with it. And I, I, I would say the scriptures disagrees with that, as we'll see tonight. So Peter, in this passage, and we're not getting really in depth in this passage tonight, it's, we're just kind of looking at what he's saying here. And Peter was an eyewitness to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And that's what he says in verse 18, this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy moon. Now, when you read that account in the Gospels, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, Jesus, there he is in his, his human form and his human flesh and human clothes on. And as he was transfigured before them, uh, his, 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 um, his visage was, it shined like the sun. And even his garments were white and glistening. And actually, even after they come off the moon, um, there, was some, there was a radiance about him because they were amazed when they saw him, even after they came down off the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And of course, they were so excited and they were kind of dumbfounded, you know, and, and the, the suggestion was, well, let's, let's make three booze um, for you and for Moses and Elijah and we'll, we'll just hang around up here, you know. Um, so it was, they didn't really know what to think about it, but it definitely made an impression. And if you were there, you would be impressed too. And he never, ever forgot that. But the amazing thing in verse, uh, no, uh, verse number 19, he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, especially when you're dealing with Pentecostal people or charismatic people, they really emphasize the experience. And there, there are experiences that we can have in our Christian life. But all of our experiences have to be measured by the word of God. You've got to evaluate what you experience with the truth of God's word. Because, you know, otherwise, you know, where is the standard? Uh, there's all kinds of experiences. Different false religions will have experiences. Cults will have uh, experiences. But Peter's saying that as great as that experience was, the word of God is more sure. It's more reliable. The scriptures are more reliable, a more sure word of prophecy. And then he says, Where on do you do well? Uh, that you take heed is unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. In other words, we continue to learn from God's word and it should get later and later. We should have more um, information today than we had 10 years ago. It's like when you're building a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, when you're first learning the Bible, reading the Bible, you really don't know where anything fits and it's like a bunch of jigsaw pieces. But you start working and you start studying and you'll find, well, here's the corner. And then you'll say, here's a piece, and that goes there. And you see how the pieces fit together. Now, several years after you've started the, uh, the, the, the puzzle, you'll still find there's some pieces, you know, I'm not exactly sure where they fit. And it's a bad thing to take a jigsaw puzzle and put a piece there. It doesn't really fit. And then you bang it into place. And some people do that. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not a good thing. Um, so he says that, that, we, there, that, that knowledge of Scripture should be increasing. Then he says in verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men speak, uh, men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The word moved means to be borne along. We use this illustration. 
that you throw a stick into a stream and the stick will go wherever the water carries it. The water might take it over to this bank or over to that bank or down the middle. But wherever the water carries the branch or the stick, that's where it's going to go. That's the idea here, that uh, these holy men of God spake as they were born along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, whatever God the Holy Spirit wanted written down, that's what was written down. Amen. So what we see from that is that God has, an, he has a purpose. He has um, an understanding. He has a meaning uh, to the things that he's writing down. And it's not up to me through private interpretation to come along and say, well, I think that that's what that means. And it's, it's really divorced from its context, divorced from the rest of Scripture, and really divorced from what the Holy Spirit meant when he wrote it down. He cannot take the writings of Scripture and twist it and make it um, what we want it to mean. It has to, and we've got to be very careful that we, when we interpret the Bible, that we're trying to get... Uh, the meaning that the Holy Spirit meant when he wrote that scripture down. Uh, if you look over, um, well, that's, that's our next, next point. Let's, let's look at uh, some other things here. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15, uh, concerning the abomination of desolation, he puts this little statement in, whosoever readeth, let him understand. So every scripture that God puts into the Bible is given for our understanding. He wants us, when we read it, to understand it. And if you're reading through the Bible and say, I don't understand that, well, just keep reading. Uh, it's like when people are listening to me when I first, you know, you know, we've got visitors here tonight and it might be difficult to understand what I'm actually saying. <laughs> but what I encourage people is just keep listening and uh, you'll pick it back up again and then you may be able to go back and fill in some of what I said earlier that you didn't understand. And that's what it is with Scripture. You might not understand everything, just keep reading. And uh, sooner or later, you'll be able to put those uh, pieces of the puzzle in their proper place. So Jesus wanted his disciples to be certain about the future, which he promised. I love that uh, verse in John 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. And then he says this, if it were not so, I would have told you. One of the reasons, personally, I know that there's a heaven. Now, we know there's a heaven because the Bible says so. But because Jesus said, if there was no heaven, I would have told you. In my Father's house are many, uh, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So the Lord wants his disciples, he wants you and me, uh, to have an understanding and really to be certain about the things that he's revealed about the future. There's many things about the future we don't know, and that's okay. Um, but don't let what you don't know stop you from believing what he has revealed. Yes. There's things that we should know and what we should believe. Also, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1 for just a moment. Now, there's some things that we can't know, that we're not supposed to know. But as I said, there are some things that he has revealed to us. Now, I just want you to point this out in Acts chapter 1, uh, in verse number 6. It says, when, and he's basically told them to wait for the promise of the Father to stay in Jerusalem till you be endued from on high. And verse 6, and he says, uh, they said, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now that has to do with timing. Um, you know, these people are always guessing about when the rapture is going to happen. That's a nonsense. Nobody knows when the rapture is going to happen. Now we're going to look at the different things that are taking place in the news and we're going to apply uh, those things to what Scripture prophesies. Okay, but you cannot know when the rapture happens. And really no man knows the day or the hour of the second coming also. I do want you to notice in verse 6 something that is interesting here. They asked him, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What was in their mind concerning the church in Israel? In fact, they really didn't understand the church yet because Pentecost was still coming. But in their mind, they understood that the kingdom was promised to the nation of Israel, that indeed it was a political kingdom. We'll get into this later in Daniel chapter 2, that uh, the stone that is cut out without hands, it smashes the image upon its feet, the ten toes, the ten kings, uh, that symbolized Christ's kingdom, the stone that grows in the great mountain that fills all the earth. The Christ kingdom replaces Gentile world powers. The image is destroyed. The wind blows it away. Um, if you believe the kingdom is now, what you're saying is Christ's kingdom 
is now, and it exists alongside Gentile world powers. But that's not what Daniel chapter 2 says. And the disciples had this, this knowledge of the kingdom. And they basically said, Lord, are you going to do it now? Will at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, if, if Jesus, if there isn't going to be a kingdom for Israel, a political kingdom, somebody's phone's going off. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm glad it wasn't mine because it has happened before. Um, the point is this, if there wasn't going to be a kingdom, this would be an opportune time for Jesus to say to the disciples, hey guys, there isn't going to be a literal kingdom for national Israel. I'm going to do something completely different. That would have been the time to say it. But he didn't say it. Do you know why? Because it is real and their expectations are based upon Old Testament scriptures and it will happen. The point that they didn't know and the point that they couldn't know is when it's going to happen, but not if it's going to happen. That's a very important point, I think, to make. So anyway, scriptures, the scripture is given to be understood. And even when it comes to prophetic scriptures, even some of the symbolic uh, prophecies that we'll see in the book of the Revelation, there's a way to understand that. But it doesn't negate all of the very literal, um, straightforward prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the nation of Israel. Then under two, their scripture must be interpreted with the same meaning God intended. And this is what I was getting at earlier there. Um, if you go back to Second Peter uh, chapter 1, speaking about uh, the meaning of scripture, this is really, really important. Um, we've got to ascertain now, you know, God's not going to come and wrestle us about getting the, the, the right interpretation. We all have our free choice to do whatever we want with the scriptures. So everybody has the right to be wrong. And there's a lot of wrong interpretations out there. But I know one of these days I'm going to stand before God, me, him, me, Jesus, and the Bible. And he's going to say, what think ye? And what did you study? Uh, have you, you know, Jesus said to the rich man, you know, have, what, uh, what readest thou concerning the scriptures? What readest thou? What do you think about it? Um, and so it's up to individuals to read and to study the scriptures for themselves and interpret the Bible for themselves. And I'm just here as a tool. Teachers and preachers are um, gifts of God to the church uh, to help us all in the study of scripture. But um, like in Acts 17, uh, when the Apostle Paul went to, into the synagogue there in Berea, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things be so. I got a message back from the Roman Catholic friend that I was been talking to, you know, and, uh, and I gave him a list of about 10 different, very simple questions in scriptures. And one of the first things he said to me, he says, I'm not going to get into this discussion on the Bible. Well, I mean, Jesus was all into the discussion of the Bible you know, have you never read? You do err not knowing the scriptures. And again, they were more noble that they received the word with, and they, they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, we're talking about a literal interpretation. The scriptures have an intended meaning. And if, God, if, if words mean anything and God invented language, then it has to be the normal usage of the words. Um, and some people don't accept that. And so they, they twist the words and they rest the words. They change it. Uh, this whole thing is called, you'll, I think I have a note down here somewhere on it, um, that when people do that, um, uh, the last part of uh, paragraph two there, changing from a literal interpretation is often called spiritualizing or allegorizing the scripture. In other words, they depart from it. It doesn't really mean, like we, we had an example of that the last time when he talks about the lamb and the wolf land down to gather, and the lion eating straw, straw like, like, uh, like the, the, the cow. Now, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. There's going to be a time in the future when lions will, uh, will be herbivores. They will be eating grass, just like cows eat grass. They will not eat um, meat anymore. And, of course, the, the commentator said that's impossible. Because their whole digestive system will have to change. And the big teeth. And, oh, by the way, pandas have big teeth. You ever seen a panda? They have, they have big teeth. Um, what do they eat? Bamboo, and they're primarily vegetarian. But the thing is, when God created the animal life, they were all herbivores. They were all vegetarians. It wasn't until after the fall and sin and then death came because of Adam's fall that animals started to eat one another. Um, so anyway, uh, look over at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. It's something that's very common today. 
for people to misinterpret the scriptures and they they and it's it's unbelievable some of the things that they will say but it's nothing new peter had the same issue in his day paul had the same issue in chapter 3 and verse 15 Peter speaking about Paul, he says, Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. And this is the inspired writings of Paul, given by inspiration of God. Uh, verse 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood. Are some things in the Bible hard to be understood? Yeah. But can they still be understood? Yes. They may be hard to be understood. You might know, not know exactly where the piece of puzzle goes, but sooner or later it will have a, a place where it fits. And the point is it should be understood. Then it says, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures. He's putting Paul's writings on a par with the other scriptures. Peter is just telling us that Paul's writings and his epistles are inspired as also the other scriptures and people who are unlearned and they rest they twist, they torture the scripture to make it fit their theology. Calvinists do that. When the Bible says these the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, it's very clear he's speaking that atonement, the Christ died for all men. He tasted death for all men. But a Calvinist can't agree with that because it's not his theology. So he'll take that scripture and he'll bend it and twist it and say it means something else. He died for our sins, but the sins of the whole world, that's the, the world of the elect, the ones who will get seen. But that's not what the Bible says. And so um, it's really important that uh, if you look at that second paragraph, when the literal interpretation is changed to something else, the something else is determined by the interpreter and can have any number of meanings and so robs the Holy Spirit of his intended message. Now, that's, it specifically happens with prophecy. And as I said the last time, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing and it's a very common thing for uh, believers to have a premillennial dispensational prophecy conference. Because when you read the Bible literally, um, you're going you're to come up with the same answers. You're simply reading the Bible and therefore um, your positions, your doctrinal positions on, uh, on theology and eschatology are going to be the same. But if you have your interpretation and I have my interpretation... And we all have 500 different terms. You can't have a prophecy conference because when you get together, nobody will be able to agree. And that's, you'll, never see, you'll never see hardly anything to do with a, a post-tribulation or an amillennialist prophecy conference. Basically, what their message, it's not that they like to put forth their message. Usually, their types of meetings or when they write books, they're always attacking. They attack the dispensationalists. They attack the people who are describing uh, or understanding the Bible literally. Uh, but they don't like to put forth their own, uh, make a big deal of that, because it's usually different than this other brother or this other brother who's in their same camp. Because when you depart from the literal and you're making it up, then every, it's the sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want with it. The problem is that the Holy Spirit is robbed of the meaning that he intended when you get away from the literal interpretation. Okay, so I just kind of threw that out as a, um, an introduction to what we're looking at tonight. God has a track record of literal interpretation in all the scriptures and specifically in the prophetic scriptures. And we have a wonderful advantage because you and I live between the first and second comings of Christ. Uh, but even before Christ, there was many prophecies in the Old Testament that were already fulfilled. And so the question is, how were they fulfilled? Were they fulfilled in some sort of spiritual way? Um, or were they allegorized? Uh, was the fulfillment something that was kind of nebulous or not really uh, something definite? Or when the prophecy was made, is it a literal, definite, specific thing? And then when it was fulfilled, was it again a literal, specific, definite fulfillment of exactly what was said? Well, that's really what you find when you look at the fulfillment of uh, prophecies. So we can... Uh, judge how future prophecies uh, are going to be fulfilled based upon God's track record of how fulfilled stuff that's already been fulfilled. Does that make sense to you? So the prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming were fulfilled in a certain way. So God's not going to change his mind now and have a, you know, a dual hermeneutic. In other words, that he's going to interpret uh, other prophecies differently than he did in the first coming. So the second coming prophecy is different than the first coming prophecies. No, he's consistent and we're going to see that. So let's look at Micah chapter 5. 
First of all, we're going to look at prophecies concerning Christ's first coming. Uh, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. So we'll do it right after Jonah. Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2. Well known verse, especially at this time of year. Um, now here's a prophecy. And there's uh, the, the, I've, I've given four prophecies just concerning his birth, and then we'll look specifically at number five there, Psalm 22, concerning his death. They said there was 300 prophecies fulfilled in that, in that time of Christ's passion when he, when he died for us. And so these were specific, detailed prophecies. Uh, here in Micah 5, verse 2, it's telling us about uh, where Jesus would be born. And so in Micah 5, 2, it says, But thy Bethlehem, Aphratha, the word Aphratha means fruitful, which is actually a particular name of the Bethlehem uh, four miles south of Jerusalem in the land of Judea. But thy Bethlehem, Aphratha, though there be little among the thousands of Judah. Bethlehem, oh little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a very small, it's just a little tiny village. By the way, Bethlehem, which means Beth, means house of. Lehem means bread. So Bethlehem means house of bread. There was another Bethlehem up in the northern part of Israel. So he specifically mentions not only Bethlehem, but the exact place called Bethlehem and where it was, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Let me ask you something. Has Jesus ever been a ruler in Israel? So it, it's partially fulfilled, partially not fulfilled. And We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then it says, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus, his goings forth, his existence is from everlasting. Jesus didn't begin in Mary's womb um, or at his birth. He is, in ever, he is ever, in the beginning was the word. When the beginning started, the word was already there and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the point I'm saying here is that um, he specifically says Bethlehem in Judea. Question, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem of Judea. It's interesting, the wise men came from the east. The wise men, the Magi, that's, those are terms used in the book of Daniel. I, I personally think that the Magi had the book of Daniel. I think they had Daniel chapter 9, and they knew the approximate time of his birth. They knew when he was coming to present. It's actually given you there in Daniel chapter 9. And so they knew the timing when they should look for his star. But they didn't have Micah. They didn't know where. So where did they go? They came to Jerusalem. And what happened in Jerusalem? Old Herod, he got the scribes out. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, you know. And he says, uh, you know, where's the Messiah going to be born? And the scribes get Micah 5. He's going to be born in Micah. And Micah 5 too, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So off they go to Bethlehem. You would think that the scribes would be kind of interested to go along and find out. Or that Herod would be interested in that. Because here you have a supernatural prediction. And so the wise men go on their way. Now, the reason this is important is because when the Bible speaks about places prophetically, you know, this is not a heavenly Bethlehem. This is not a spiritualized Bethlehem. That's not really Bethlehem in Judea. It's really Bethlehem somewhere else. When the Bible speaks of Jerusalem, what is it speaking of? It's speaking of Jerusalem in the promised land. Okay. Now, there is, a, there is a place called the New Jerusalem that the Bible speaks of, but let's go over to the, the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, for just a moment. And, and just kind of, we won't take as much time on the rest of these, but the reason it's important when we look at these specific prophecies about Jesus' first coming is it's this, it sets up a pattern for how God fulfills other prophecies. So in Zechariah 14, look at verse number 3. Then shall the Lord, now the whole context from chapter 12, is, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the armies coming against Jerusalem. Half the city's taken. Um, you know, this is when you hear the sound of the trumpet and the, 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 the cavalry shows up and the homesteaders are, are surrounded and, and, uh, and, and they, they're rescued. And so in verse 3, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So physically, G and of course, we know it's Jesus, but it's, it's, it's the Lord, it's Jehovah, it's Yahweh that he's mentioned here, capital O-R-D. So the Lord shall go forth. Verse 4, and his feet, whose feet? The Lord's feet. Does God, does Jehovah have feet? Yeah, because Jesus is Jehovah. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, uh, thereof toward the east, toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. 
and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. So when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, um, you know, some people don't even believe he's going to come back again. Yet in Acts chapter 1, he says, why stand, the angel said to the disciples, why stand you here gazing? The same Jesus that is taken from you shall so come in like manner. Where, did, where was he taken from? The Mount of Olives on the eastern side of Jerusalem. When he comes back again, that mountain's going to split. There's going to be a valley formed, a brand new valley. Uh, the Valley of Decision. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Valley of Jeh Jehoshaphat. That valley doesn't exist now. And half of the mount goes north, half of the mount goes south. And there's a, there's a valley that comes from the eastern gate of Jerusalem right down into the Dead Sea. And that actually becomes the, uh, the wine press of the wrath of God. That's where the blood flows as has the horse's bridle. It's a wine press. And that blood flows down into the Jordan Valley. And I don't want to take the time to try to explain why that I believe this happens. Uh, that's a rift valley. At some point in the future, the Dead Sea is going to have fish in it, like the Mediterranean Sea, saltwater fish. I think something happens ge geologically where the water from the Red Sea comes into that valley and floods the Jordan Valley. The point is, there's a river of blood that runs down into the valley, um, the Jordan Valley, and then flows down and comes out into the Red Sea at Elat. That's the southernmost city in, in Israel. And you know what that distance is? It's exactly 200 miles People say the horses, the, the blood flows as, as has the horse's bridle in the valley of Megiddo. That's not true. The, the Bible then says it happens on the eastern side of Jerusalem. And it flows from 200 miles. And so it goes from Jerusalem all the way to the Red Sea. Exact, check it out on Google. It's exactly 200 miles. Um, and so the point what we're saying here, though, is that this Mount of Olives is physically Mount of Olives. This Jerusalem that, G, that Jesus is coming to, to, to deliver is Jerusalem of the, of, the, of the Bible. If you look over at chapter 14 and verse number 11, and you can read the whole chapter, but the men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Has Jerusalem ever been safely inhabited at? Well, when Jesus comes, it will be. There will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. They'll beat their swords and the plowshares, their spears and the pruning hooks. When has that ever happened? It hasn't. And then if you come down to verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. Who's that? It's Jesus. who's physically present, sitting upon the throne of his father David, and to keep the feast of, the, of tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Has that ever happened? No, it hasn't. It's, it's millennial. It's speaking about when Jesus comes back. But where is Jesus coming back to? He's coming back to the earth. He's coming to Jerusalem. And so it's going to be the Jerusalem that we know is Jerusalem. It's not some spiritual Jerusalem. It's not a heavenly Jerusalem. And I don't want to take the time to, to stay on this more, but when uh, it was prophesied that Jesus would sit upon the throne of his father David, where is the throne of his father David? Jerusalem in Israel. People say, no, Jesus is reigning from his uh, throne in heaven. Well, Jesus is sitting at the right, the right hand of God in heaven. Jesus is sitting in the Father's throne right now. But his throne is the throne of David. And in Matthew chapter uh, 25, it says, when he shall come in his glory, oh, when he shall come and sit upon the throne of his glory, then the nations shall be gathered before him and divide the sheep from the goats. I was talking to Jehovah's Witness one day, and I said, because they believe his throne's in heaven, I said, no, wait a minute. I says, Jesus is coming from heaven to the earth, and then he sits upon his throne. I says, so where's the throne? He says, it's in heaven. Okay, now let me try that again. Jesus is coming from heaven. By the way, the whole chapter 25, if you, it's all parables about the Son of Man who goes away and then he comes back and he returns. So he's coming back from heaven to the earth. Then he's going to sit upon his throne, the throne of his glory. Where's his throne? In heaven. It's like beating your head against a brick wall. He comes from heaven to the earth to sit upon his throne. Where's his throne? On the earth. And there's many other scriptures that deal with that. I'm simply saying this, that when the Bible prophesies about Jesus' first coming, it's all literal and physical and just as you would expect it. You don't have to twist the scriptures on that. Uh, look over at Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, another uh, scripture that's important for us right now as we think about the incarnation and his birth. It says, 
in chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, you know, just on, on the face value, when you read that, it's like reading the New Testament uh, fulfillment of that. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, people say, well, the word virgin there means a young woman. Well, what's, what's the big deal about a young woman having a baby? He says it was a sign. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. And the only way it would be a sign is if it's supernatural. So it's not just a, it's not a young woman. The Mary was a young woman, but she was a virgin. She, she had not known a man. And that's exactly way, the way it was fulfilled. It was fulfilled literally. Look over Genesis 49 and verse number 10. Now we'll get later on, we'll get into some specific things like Isaiah chapter 9. On the us, us a child is born, on the us a son is given. But you know the next verse, um, uh, that's 9 verse 6, verse 7 talks about his kingdom and the peace uh, that he will rule, that he will rule uh, from his father David's throne and that he will rule over the house of Israel. See, that part hasn't been fulfilled yet. Now in Genesis chapter 49, here we have the prophecy of Jacob uh, on his 12 sons. And when he comes to Judah, and by the way, Judah was the one who sold Joseph, wasn't he? But you know what happened? First of all, God chastened Judah because he lost two sons. But Judah was the one that came to Joseph and he owned up. He was the one, he was the spokesman. Now Judah wasn't the, Reuben was the oldest. Judah was number four. But he became the leader of the, of the 12 because he was the one that confessed. He was the one that owned up. And he said, send Benjamin home, I will be your slave. And when Joseph heard that, everything broke. Because they had, they had met the conditions. He had met the conditions of repentance. And from that time on, and by the way, Reuben, as he talks about it here in Genesis 49, he didn't forget, uh, Jacob didn't forget what Reuben did in sleeping with uh, his concubine. And it's, it's mentioned here. But not one bad thing said about Judah. Because Judah repented. And so, in, we'll, we'll, we'll look at verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. The word Shiloh means rest giver. Uh, title of the Messiah, and on the him, on the Shiloh, shall the gathering of the people be. Has that happened yet? No. But the simple point is this: um, Where did Jesus come out of? The tribe of Judah, Matthew, Matthew chapter one. And so it's it's a very simple thing. If words mean anything, whatever God predicts, whatever He prophesies, that's exactly how it comes to pass. Look at Jeremiah chapter thirty-three. Jeremiah chapter thirty-three. Now, in probably within two months, we're going to be starting a brand new study in the book of the Revelation. And I've actually never preached through the book of the Revelation before. Um, you say, well, isn't all you believe about prophecy out of the book of the Revelation? Not very much. Now, Revelation, we can get some details there. But most of my conviction about premillennial truth is from the Old Testament. It's not from the New Testament, not from the book of the Revelation. In Jeremiah 33, look at verse 14. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. Notice the word, B, the branch is capital B. This is speaking of Christ. A uh, branch of righteousness to grow up unto David. And he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. It's speaking about Christ as king of Israel. Verse 16. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That is Jehovah Tzitkinu. So the name of Jerusalem, her name is the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Tzitkinu. And it's named because it is the son of David. It is the branch of righteousness that grows up unto David. Look at verse 17. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. So again, specific prophecies. Where be born, how it be born, what tribe it be born of, what family it be born of. And when you look at the fulfillment, it's absolutely exactly the way God prophesied it would happen. Well, let's look at uh, Psalm 22, because I, I do want to hurry on here if I can. I'm trying to get it under an hour tonight. Okay, Psalm 22 is the crucifixion psalm. And we can't go through all of it tonight, obviously. Uh, but this is a wonderful, wonderful prophecy written by David. 
And many of the Messianic Psalms help us to see inside the humanity of Jesus. What was Jesus feeling when he was going through this? It's really dictated through the Messianic Psalms. And of course, the good bit is there in verse 16. But I want you to notice verse 12. And this is an interesting detail that we picked up when we studied the Herods. Because Jesus was brought before an assembly not once. We always think of Jesus coming before the Romans and the Romans, you know, uh, uh, whipping him and, and then crucifying him. But there was another group that he came before first. And, uh, and that was, that was uh, uh, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, whose who's, uh, center of control was in Galilee. His, uh, his uh, capital was Tiberias, where Jesus actually never went. He'd never seen Jesus before. He'd heard about him and he really wanted to hear him. And so when old Pilate heard that he was of Galilee, he thought, I can, get, I can wash my hands of this right now. He says, because you need to go to your jurisdiction, and that's Galilee. And guess what? This is the Passover, and so everybody's here. And Herod Antipas is here, so I'm sending you to Herod. Now, the thing is, Herod Antipas that had no jurisdiction over, uh, over hurting Jesus. He couldn't touch him physically. Now, if you look down here, verse 12... Many bulls have come past me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Now, Bashan is in Galilee. Bashan is actually the Golden Heights. And if you go to Israel, you'll, you'll t they'll take you up on the way to... Um, uh, anyway, they'll take you up north. You'll go, go to the Golden Heights. When you get up there, there's two things you'll find on the Golden Heights. You'll have tank maneuvers. You'll see that that's where they do all the tank maneuvers because the front line was Syria on the Golden Heights. Uh, Syria used to own that and then they used to sit on the Golden Heights and then rain shells down on Galilee, on Tiberias and so anyway Israel took that ground and so you'll have tank manoeuvres the other thing you'll have up there is cattle farms everywhere you look, cattle farms, cattle everywhere on the Golan Heights and so Bashan was known for its cattle farming many bulls have come past me strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lamb now when Jesus went before uh, Herod Antipas uh, Herod tried to get him to do some miracle and Jesus basically was not in the entertaining business and Jesus answered him not a word so then Herod set his men of war on him and they set him at naught I can just imagine these big soldiers. Now, these are, these are basically Israeli soldiers. These are from Galilee, these men. These strong bulls of Bashan. So even though he's using um, picturesque language here, it's still a literal prophecy of people who would surround Jesus and they got in his face and you just, they're, I'm sure they're right up in his face, sat him in it not, you're nobody, you think you're a king, you're nobody, and they just gave him what for, but they could not touch him. Couldn't touch him because it wasn't his jurisdiction. So we sent them back to Pilate. And that's where the Romans get involved. Look at verse 16 for dogs. And that's a common terminology the Jews would use for Gentiles. And the Romans who surrounded them at the behest of Pilate were certainly Gentiles. For dogs have come past me. The, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Amazing. Written by David a thousand years before Jesus was born. David never had his hands and feet pierced. Jews didn't even know at that time what, what crucifixion was. The Phoenicians started it about 700, but the, the Romans popularized it about 200 BC. And so the Jews' way of execution was by stoning. This having feet and hands pierced would have been unknown to the Jews, unknown to David. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God is prophesying about the son of David and what he would go through. And even greater details, he says, I may tell all my bones. The word tell, no English word from teller, like a bank teller, a bank counter. I can count all my bones. They look and stir upon me. You know, when Jesus hung there, he didn't have any clothes on. There was no loincloth. He hung there in shame and in nakedness. They look and stir upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Just like the four, the quadron, the four Roman soldiers, they took his garments. They divided them among themselves. But there was one garment that was expensive. It was woven from top without the bottom without seam, like a poncho. If one of them had said, I'll have that, the other three would have been on them. So they, they drew lots for it. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. How in the world did David know that? Oh, the Bible's just a lot of fairy tales. There's nothing to it written by men. No. There's something to this. 
But what we're saying there concerning this first coming prophecies, that's exactly the way it happened. Did he have his feet and hands pierced? Yes. Did they cut part his garments among them and cast lots for his vesture? Absolutely. Could he tell all his bones? He was naked. He could see every rib. He could count all of his bones. It is exactly, this is, this is a vivid description of what happened at the cross. Go to Isaiah 53. It tells you why it happened. The theology behind the cross, Isaiah 53, 712 years BC. So what we're saying, this is just a, this is scratching the surface here. But when you look at the first coming prophecies, they were understandable. They were detailed. They were literal. And when they were fulfilled, it was fulfilled in detail. It was fulfilled literally. What you would expect it to happen is what happened. He doesn't take this and, and, and twist this into some sort of mystical type of thing that wouldn't, you wouldn't recognize. And when, they come, when, 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 theolo when theologians come to uh, the church in Israel and making uh, the church Israel and, and we're fulfilling all the promises of the Israel, it's just it's a nonsense. And we'll, we'll look at some of those details later on. I'm just trying to get you into the way of thinking about why we believe in a literal interpretation because God's got a track record of it. Well, let me hurry on with just two other things. Look at Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. So, and we could have a whole list of things here. I mean, this is, you know, we would be here forever. Um, so prophecies concerning Christ's first coming. Then prophecies concerning ancient cities. Now, again, why would this be important? Well, because Jerusalem is an ancient city that has a place in prophecy. And many other places have um, a fulfillment in biblical prophecy in the future. Now, when Joshua came to Jericho, um, this was the symbol of defiance against God. And God was going to make a point about this. God was going to win the battle on this. Um, but I want you to notice some details here. Joshua 6 verse 17 says, And the city shall be accursed. Now, that's a pretty serious thing. Here's a city that is accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Come down to verse 26. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. Um, and so basically what Joshua, he's making a prophecy here. He says, this city is cursed. Basically what he's saying, it's not going to be ever rebuilt. And the person who does, does start to, to, to rebuild it um, will be judged of the Lord. And he basically says, it's an amazing thing, he says, uh, he'll set up the foundation when he starts the building, the death of his firstborn. When he finishes and puts the gates in it, his youngest son will die. Now look over um, at 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Because here's an amazing thing. This prophecy was fulfilled during the days of Aham. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 16. And down in verse number 34, right at the end of the chapter. Um, in his days, that is the days of Ahab, uh, in his days did Hael the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abraham, his firstborn, actually names his son here, Abraham his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Zagub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. Here's what I'm saying. What was prophesied happened. Exactly. His firstborn died when he laid the foundation. His youngest son died when he put the gates in. And when you look at, uh, this is Jericho today. Um, I think I'll turn the light on that one. Um, this is ancient Jericho. No more and no less. They dug these uh, trenches in here to go down and the, the archaeologists. The, the, is this not on? Thank you for should have rung the bell. <laughs> anyway, it's just, and, 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 and so anyway um, and they've done all kinds of archaeological digs here. You know, there was actually two walls around the city. Um, and whatever uh, the Bible, how the Bible describes, um, it basically, um, let me just stand over here for a second. Uh, the way it's described is perfectly the way it happened. Um, and when you look at the archaeology, of Jericho, it is exactly as you will find um, in the scriptures, which is, of course, what you would expect. The Bible is the word of God and can be trusted. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, but I'm just simply saying this. The Bible says that this thing is accursed. And here we are today, and it still 
hasn't been rebuilt and it won't be rebuilt because that, that curse is still there today. But it's a literal, definite, detailed prophecy and it was absolutely fulfilled uh, in detail. All right, let's go on to the last one. Ezekiel chapter 26, and we'll try to go through this as quick as we can here. Ezekiel chapter 26, and this is the, the prophecy of the city of Tyre. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 26. Now, this is another wonderful testament to the supernatural character of Scripture and the accuracy of prophecy. And so this was both prophesied and fulfilled uh, in the Old Testament. And we have it there. Uh, actually, you could look at your notes. I've got the scriptures basically written out there for you. So Tyre rejoiced at the downfall of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar, right? Jerusalem, Jewish people are under judgment because of their sin. Nebuchadnezzar comes in, takes them captive over to Babylon. Well, the enemies of Jerusalem and Israel were rejoicing at that. You know, there was uh, two bomb explosions in Jerusalem. I don't know if you heard this or not. I follow a guy called Amir uh, Safari. And uh, he basically he'll give you all the world news on prophecy. And what he, he's in Israel. He lives in Israel as a Christian, a uh, good brother. And uh, anyway, there was two bomb explosions in Israel uh, this past week. And I think there was a young 16-year-old uh, young man that was killed. Do you know what the Palestinians did? And this, you, you've seen this before, I'm sure. But they will, they will stop motors and they'll have these plates of, of sweets and candy and they'll pass. They celebrate. When Israelis get killed, it could be little children that are murdered, but the Palestinians will rejoice in that. And they, they celebrate and they, they, they give candy to one another and send presents. They, they love that. I'm going to tell you something. There's a day of reckoning coming. But that's nothing new because this city of Tyre, this is on the, the coast of Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon. And this is, this is the Mediterranean. And here's, uh, this is not a really good picture for this, but the old city of Tyre. And you notice there's an arrow here because you know what? They don't know, even today they don't know where the old city of Tyre is. Okay. So I want you to just look at your notes here. And we'll go through this real quickly. The, the, because they rejoiced against Jerusalem, God says, now I'm going to judge you. And he, he made very specific detailed prophecies about the city of Tyre. And the first guy that's coming, going to come along is the same guy that, that sacked Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar is the first one's come, but he's not the last one. This is a very, very interesting prophecy. Okay. So as we read here, uh, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also spreak, uh, scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall come, become a spoil to the nations. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches. You know, uh, the people of Tyre were... Uh, the Phoenicians, the Syrophoenicians, they were seagoing people, they were trading people. If you read the, the next chapter, it'll, it'll tell you all the stuff that they had. I mean, they, these people, it was, like, it was like New York, and they had everything. All the goods, all the opulent goods of the world came through this city. But God says it's all going to be destroyed. It'll become a spoil to the nations. Verse 12, And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses. And they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And I will cause the noise of thy songs to cease, and the sound of thy harp shall be no more heard. And I will make thee like a top of a rock, thy shall be a place to spread nets upon, thy shall be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken, it saith the Lord God. So this prophecy was that the city of Tyre would be destroyed, that her walls would be broken down, and this was fulfilled uh, just a few, just a couple, of, just a few years later. Uh, the prophecy was in 588. I think two years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene. He lays a 13-year siege against the, the old city of Tyre. And after 13 years, he really went, goes in and he wrecks the place. He destroys the whole city. He burns it. He, he knocks their towers down, their walls down. Now, in the meantime, now Nebuchadnezzar is from Babylon. He doesn't have a, a navy. The, Syrophen the Phoenicians had all kinds of navy. During that 13 years, they were... They were basically ferrying people from the mainland here and the old city, wherever it was. Some people believe it's right here, but I don't believe it is. I think it's right somewhere down here. Um, and so they would ferry people out to this island that they owned as well. 
And they began a new settlement out here. They began a new city out here. And they started fortifying the whole city with a large wall. It's 45 feet, I think it was. All the, all the way around this island. And so by the time Nebuchadnezzar got done, most of the people had escaped already, were on the island. He couldn't get to them because they didn't have a navy. And so at the end of the 13 years here, they gave up and he came in and he absolutely wrecked this beautiful city on, right on the sea coast. Beautiful, beautiful place. And Nebuchadnezzar wrecks it. Now, that's fair enough. The Bible prophesied that would happen. But there's another part of this prophecy that's really strange. And if you look down on page two, there's the strange prophecy. The strange part of the prophecy is where it says that they would lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And also I'll scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock so you wouldn't even know where it was. When I'm done with this city, he says, it'll be like the top of the rock. There won't be one brick upon another. You wouldn't even know there was a city there. Now, how does that get fulfilled? And it wasn't fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar. Which is an interesting point, and I do make the point there. Note many times in prophecy, there's a gap between segments of the prophecies to be fulfilled. Do you know, I'm going to show you later on that there's a prophecy that Jesus would come. And in that same verse, in the same sentence, you have his first coming and his second coming in the very same sentence. But there's at least 2,000 years between the first event and the second event. Sometimes when God writes prophecy, just, he writes it all together. And you don't see that there's gaps in there. And the same is true here. There's a gap of 241 years where this, the old city of Tyre lay in rub, rubble and ruins and the remnants of the Phoenicians went out, the, the uh, citizens of Tyre went out of this new island, had a new community out there. And so for 241 years, they were defended because they were an island city. They had a navy. Nobody could touch them. Well, what about the second part of the prophecy? Now, what army, what people in the right mind would carry off a whole city? Stones, timbers, and even the dust, scrape it all up and throw it into the sea. You know, people are, you know, sometimes industrious, but we're usually lazy. Why would you do that? Nobody in the right mind would do it. And for 241 years, nobody did it. Then we have a guy called Alexander the Great. And I like you can, and there's lots of information on your notes here. And you can study this, you can uh, research this yourself. This, this is all secular history. And so he's, he's uh, conquering the known world at that time. Uh, he's coming down the Mediterranean coast. He's going to make his way to Egypt, where he establishes Alexandria after himself, Alexander. And on the way down, he conquers everybody, and everybody's, you know, bow down to him, and he, they give him tribute or taxes. Now, one of the things he actually did was he would go into these conquered peoples and he would assimilate their religion. So he'd go into their temples. He would in, in, encourage their priesthoods, whatever religion it was, and he would offer sacrifice in their temple. Now, when he came to Tyre, they had a temple. You see the temple right here? They had a temple right there. Um, and he, he wanted to come across and offer an offering and basically subjugate them and they could pay tribute. But tribute wasn't really the big thing. He just wanted to control them. And he did that through the religion. Well, they said, there's no way you're coming into our temple. That would be a, a blasphemous thing. It'd be a, we, we wouldn't allow that. And so they basically thumbed their nose at Alexander. Because they're, they're living out here. That's a half mile of, of, of sea. And guess what? Alexander doesn't have a navy either. So they thought they were safe. And they said, nope, we're not giving tribute. You're not coming over here. You're not coming into our temple. Take yourself off. And old Alexander, they say this is his greatest military achievement what he does next this happened uh, in i think december of 333 bc and he works all the way through july of 332 bc and here's what he does of course he's collected a lot of slaves and so on and so here's what he does he takes he builds a causeway now those of you who are in northern Ireland, we have the giants causeway and a causeway is a is a uh, could be natural or could be man-made it's basically um, a jot of land that goes between two places across water. It's like a big bridge. Only this bridge is made out of dirt and stones and timbers and dust. Because he had these uh, engines of war. These things here. Don't forget there's a big wall around this city. Around the whole island actually. And he had to bring these, these uh, engines of war out so that they could basically get over the wall. Well those things run on wheels. Well, how are you going to get it across there? Well, what he did was he took all the old tire, wherever it was, and he transported all that rubble 
through the slaves, and they started building this causeway all the way out across that half mile. Now, this is secular history. You can look, it's up in the history books that actually happened. Now, here's the Phoenicians over with their, their boats. They had a navy. They're, kind of, they're fighting them all the way along here with their navy. Uh, but it's easier fighting from land than it is from a boat. And so in July uh, 332 BC, he finally took the city of New Tyre and he wrecked the place. 30,000 people died. The, men, uh, the women and children were all sold into slavery and he made an example of them. So he made that uh, causeway all the way across and uh, defeated the city. That's the way it looked. Right across here and uh, got into the city. They also had um, some boats that came in here as well. But um, Alexander fulfilled the prophecy. The prophecy was that all the material from that city would be taken from its site and thrown into the sea. I mean, it's interesting what he says. He says, Thou shalt be a place to spread gnats upon. But earlier he says, um, I will also scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of gnats in the midst of the sea. How do you spread gnats in the middle of the water? Sure, you would do that on land, right? How does fishermen clean their gnats and spread their gnats out to dry in the middle of the ocean? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But see, what happened was when they built that, uh, that causeway across, that the present coat, what happens with the, the currents and everything, that the sands washed up there. Here's a picture of it back in 1931. So here's the, here's the island. It's not a very good photograph. Here's the island, and that moat came across here like that. That causeway came across like that, and then the sea basically washed up sand on either side of it. And so what, where do the fishermen? The fishermen come out here with their fishing nets. Here they are in the midst of the sea and spreading their nets, where it used to be in the middle of the sea, but now it's on land because that's where the rubble from the city was placed. And if you go there today, that's what it looks like. It's still there today from Alexander's time. Um, you know, way over 2,300 years ago. That's an amazing thing. Now, the point is simply this. How, did, how does God prophesy things? He prophesies things in detail uh, in an understandable way. Uh, even though it was strange, there's no doubt of what he's saying. He says, I'm going to take the, the rubble from the city. The whole city is going to be put in the sea. You'll never be able to see it again. You won't even know where it was. It'll be a place in the middle of the sea for the spreading of gnats. And that's a strange, strange prediction. But how did it come to pass? Exactly like God said. And really, you couldn't have understood how it would be, except you're looking after the fact, and you can say, see how it all happened. But it happened exactly the way God had said it would. Um, and so God has a track record of how he deals with prophecy and how he fulfills prophecy. We have an amazing book, the Bible. And so it's an exciting thing because guess what? It's not like you're reading the book and you start with the first chapter and you got the last chapter and you're sitting somewhere reading this book from chapter one to the last chapter. Guess what? You're in the book. The final chapters haven't happened yet. The final chapters involve you. And so you can read ahead if you like. And prophetic scriptures are like history pre-written. You can read ahead and find out some of the things that's going to happen in the future. Those are the things that God has revealed. He wants us to understand it. He wants us to believe it. He wants us to look for it. Do we understand everything? No. There's all kinds of things we don't know. And uh, hindsight's going to be 2020. Um, you know, uh, a thousand years from now, we'll be able to look back and see all those things. Probably a lot, a lot sooner than a thousand years. Okay, any questions? Last, year, last week I forgot to ask you about that. Any questions? Does that make sense to you? Amen. Do you see what we're saying there? Is there any issues that you have about what we're saying so far? Um, God is not going to change how he fulfills prophecy. We've got a track record of how he operates and we can expect that to be happening in the future. Yes. All right. Okay, well we look forward to our next lesson as we go forward with this. Okay, well, let's have a, our prayer request at this time, and then we'll have a season.